Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1980 film Terror Train, and this is one that's been on my list to get to for quite some time. I've heard a lot of people talk about it, um, not like a ton. It doesn't get a lot of time on the social media uh, horror groups, as a lot of, you know, so bad they're good kind of films do. But this one's definitely come up a few times, so I've been meaning to get to it. Also, Jamie Lee Curtis is in it, so that's interesting. Also, David Copperfield is in it, so that's odd slash interesting. Uh, and actually, this was the only acting role that David Copperfield has ever done. And I think that this kind of soured him on that. <laughs> I think he kind of felt like he was done with it after that. Didn't have the best time with it, and I think partially was. The film didn't do that well, and it obviously didn't do that great as far as reviews go. Uh, Roger Ebert <laughs> famously put it on his most hated list. So yeah, uh, kind of bombed critically, um, which, you know, if you watch it, you can tell why it's pretty easy to see. But David Copperfield has been in other films as himself. It's just Terror Train is the only film he's been in as a role, as an actual character. So yeah. And I'll talk a little bit about my thoughts on him in this film in a little bit. So this was directed by Roger Spottiswood, uh, who also did some films such as Shoot to Kill, Turner and Hooch, watched that one as a kid, loved it, Stop or My Mom Will Shoot, Tomorrow Never Dies, yes, the James Bond film, The Sixth Day and A Street Cat Named Bob was one of the more recent ones. So that's not everything he's done, but a good amount of some of the things he's done. This one was written by Judith Rasco, who wrote scripts for Road Movie, Lifespan, Endless Love, and Havana, just to name a few, as well as T.Y. Drake, who did a script for, the, for a film called The Keeper, and then also a bunch of random TV episodes of random shows. It literally would be like one episode here, one episode here, one episode here, nothing consistent, so one of those type of writers. Obviously, Jamie Lee Curtis is in this as Alana. And she, this came out the very same year that Prom Night and The Fog came out. So Jamie Lee Curtis had Prom Night, The Fog, and Terror Train in the same year. I think that's pretty cool. That, that makes that a really great year, in my opinion, for Jamie Lee Curtis. Because they're all at least interesting films. Obviously, I love The Fog. I think The Fog is wonderful. It's my second favorite John Carpenter film. Obviously, his remake of The Thing is my number one. But followed by The Fog. Um... And obviously, Prom Night is a good time. I would put that as my number two of these movies. And then Terror Train is at the bottom of the three. But it's still worth seeing, in my opinion. I could see a situation where I would rewatch this one, but I'm not, like, huge on it. Just saying. The train, actually, in this film wasn't actually moving while they were filming, because I know there's that motion when they're filming it. It was actually in a warehouse, and they kind of rigged up some sort of contraption so that it would, it would rock the the uh the cars the train cars while they were recording so or while they were shooting so um yeah sometimes i feel like it works in the scene sometimes i feel like it made me a tad bit nauseous watching it although i wasn't on a new medication so maybe that was part of the problem when i was watching it disclaimer on that one <laughs> but to me it made me a tad bit nauseous from time to time that constant kind of like rocking but it's also interesting because they're in certain segments it's not moving at all, really, and in other ones, like, you really see it moving, so it's it's kind of interesting that it wasn't very consistent. Um, doo -doo -doo. Cinematographer John Alcott reportedly ended up rewiring all the lights in the train, and he put them all on dimmer switches so that that way he could kind of, like, really quickly, like, change the lighting for a scene, because obviously that's pretty much where they were shooting, so if he could rig all the lights in there, keep them stationary... Uh, and put them on that dimmer, super easy to light scenes. I think that was really smart, and that, I thought that was a very interesting tidbit, which is why I put this that in this. Uh, apparently, there ended up being a dispute over $25,000 that one of the producers had put in. Apparently, filming got behind kind of early, and the producer didn't feel too great about the project, so they were going to pull $25,000, which would have led to deleting five pages worth of script from the actual shooting, so after a bunch of squabbling about it, another one of the producers stepped in and said, look, you take your 25000 out, I'll put an extra 25000 in. That way we can shoot the script as is, no problems. So we almost got less in this film than we have, which I would 
I would argue that you could definitely cut this film down quite a bit, in my opinion. It does go kind of slow. It does have some stuff in there, mainly the magic portions, that feel like they're in there as, as a bit of filler to kind of stretch for time. Because it's coming in at, uh, I think with credits, it's like an hour and 38 minutes, something like that. So, just saying. So Derek McKinnon, who plays Kenny, apparently did not audition. What ended up happening is uh, McKinnon actually took a friend to audition for the film. And while he was there, they were they saw him and, and liked his look and were like, Hey, do you feel like auditioning for this part? And he was like, I guess. I mean, I'm here. I might as well do it. And they loved him for it. So he got the role. And I'll be honest, I think he did a good job. I think he did quite a good job as Kenny in the film, especially at the that end scene, that kind of intense exchange between he and Jamie Lee Curtis, where all the masks come off and it's that face-to-face. -face. The line delivery in that and the emotion that Kenny had, what McKinnon did as Kenny, really good in my opinion. Really enjoyed that. Uh, like I said, this is on Roger Ebert's most hated list, so that is interesting. Uh, so getting into the events of the film, the strobing lights in the frat house I thought made a really cool visual to open the film up. Obviously they start with the party where the prank is uh, concocted and executed, and I just love how they had those all those strobing lights all over the place inside the frat house. I think in general with the lights and, and um, interesting set pieces and lighting throughout the film creates a lot of aesthetic interest in it. Uh, very visually interesting, and I love the setting also of the train itself, because how many films have you seen, specifically horror films, that are done on a train? I really can't think of any at the moment. Train to Busan, I guess, is the only one that comes to mind at the moment, which is an excellent film. But uh, I like that this one's still relatively different, because even though this was done in 1980, many decades ago, uh, there still aren't that many horror films done on a train, so it's it's unique. And like I said, they did a good job setting up shots to make it look interesting, especially when they do a lot of those kind of like long shots from the end of one of the train cars. I think those particularly look cool, especially the one in where they're kind of like the side room. So it's like a very slender hallway and there's just light down at the one end. That looks really good and creepy. What an insanely awful prank that gets pulled in this one. Uh, and I will also point out that I believe it is a crime to steal a dead body. So Doc, I don't think would just be reprimanded on campus. I think Doc would probably be criminally charged with stealing a dead body. Um, maybe it was different back in 1980, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't. I think that was still theft and all sorts of other stuff. So not, not good. Plus, that is a really over-the-top messed up prank. So you could see why it would, like, fracture Kenny, basically, and make him want to kill. Why does Kenny start spinning, though? That's one of the things I didn't really get when everything goes wrong. Kenny stands up on the bed and just starts spinning around in that... Oh, I forget what that's specifically called, like that netting thing. Um, I don't get it. Uh, and, I, and I know that maybe they did that to set it up to mirror what they were going to do in the end with him, but... It's weird. It makes no sense. It's just odd. I guess it's just this moment of like, oh, he's just lost it. He immediately snapped, so he's just doing something random and off the cuff, but it was dumb. Uh, great premise to have a party on a train. Uh, that made me think I would love to do that at some point, have like a full-blown party on a train. That would be really cool. I don't even know if that's a thing. Maybe that's a thing somewhere where you can rent a train like that and do a party. I don't know. But I'm sure for the right price, you could kind of do that for any train, I guess. I'm sure whoever owns them would be willing to accept that cash. When Maggie and the conductor are talking about hop, uh, hoping nobody gets hurt, Maggie was the woman in the wheelchair who was working at the train station. When she and the conductor are talking about they hope nobody gets hurt during this party. That I felt like was really a wink at the audience because as an audience member, we all know what's coming. We know what we signed up for. It's death on a train and obviously all these frat kids are getting on the train. The setup's already happened with the prank gone wrong. So we know what's coming. So literally it's dialogue to be a wink at the audience being like, hope nobody gets hurt, but you audience members, you know exactly what's going to happen. So I like those little moments where they're winking at you. The first kill of Ed came a lot sooner than I actually thought it would. 
Decent enough kill with the sword, especially how everyone just thought he was joking around. I actually thought that was solid. Him dressed up as Groucho Mark, he had the sword through him. And they did a good job of laying the groundwork first of showing him consistently joking around. So that once people saw him bleeding with a sword through his, his stomach, they were all like, oh, you know, typical uh, Ed. You know, this is what he does, he just plays jokes. And they didn't take it seriously, obviously. So um, it felt kind of realistic in a sense. They sure do lament about the death of trains quite a bit in this. The conductor and the other crew members when he's talking to them uh, consistently in this film, they keep talking about like the eventual death of trains. They're very, very uh, stuck on this. And I get it from, from like the character standpoint, but from a film standpoint, do we really need all that conversation? Do we? I would argue we don't. I like the callback to the finger in the joint box joke when they kind of had uh, initially offered a joint to the guy who had um, driven the bus to get them all there with their stuff. They were like, hey, want a joint? And he had like his finger stuck through um, the, little, the little joint box. Uh, then they have the callback where the killer actually had severed a finger, put it in there and offered it up. And people thought, oh, it's that joke again. So I thought that was a good callback. I enjoyed that. Kind of funny. Uh, they went kind of hard on the magician stuff. It made it feel like filler. I mean, I kind of get that you could probably argue that, like, hey, you got David Copperfield for the film, so why don't you feature him as much as possible? So, like, I get it from that standpoint, but I'm also going to say that I didn't enjoy having so much of the magic in it. Like, just show him do magic, magic tricks, like, twice maybe, and just, like, one magic trick each time. Like, they did a lot of magic tricks in this film to the point where it literally felt like they were just trying to waste time. And they're just like, oh, man, we're not hitting time. Get Copperfield out there. Make him do some more magic. Which, apparently, he kept the tricks on camera just like the tricks he actually does on at shows. So, apparently, he was going for realism from a magician standpoint. So, that's interesting. I like how the conductor's more interested in covering up the dead body than anything, especially the first one he finds. He really seems like he just wants to take time to figure things out for himself. And then he eventually tells that other guy he works with, and I'm just like, I don't get it. And then he finds another body, and then he tries to keep that one covered up. But then some, for some reason, he just decides, I'm going to tell Alana. I don't get it. Like, characters don't really make a whole lot of sense in this film. They're very thin, which I guess you would assume that for kind of like a slapdash uh, slasher film, which this is, obviously. And how was the killer able to move Jackson's body and clean up the bathroom without anyone knowing? It's an interesting twist that when the conductor takes the other guy there to the bathroom to see the dead body, that it's not there anymore, and in fact it's the killer who's put on the costume and is like, oh no, I'm alive. But how would he have gotten the body out there, out of there? Where did it go? I mean, I guess he cut it up, but where did it go, the rest of it? And how would no one have seen that or heard that? And how did he get all the blood cleaned up? And how did nobody see any of this? It's just, it's weird. Like, you can't rationalize that stuff. It's just ridiculous. But, you know, it's a ridiculous movie, so you just accept it. Keep moving on. The severed hand gag was terribly executed. I get where they were going with that when he's with, um, oh my gosh, what, Mitchie. That's right. When he's with Mitchie in that little um, like bunk bed type thing on the train where he is like, he, he pulls out the hand, but it's actually Jackson's severed hand and puts it on her throat. Like not a bad idea, but the way it looked was so corny, so crappy that it was just, it would have been better if they kept it out. It just had actually choked her her with their regular hands. I do like the late reveal by Alana that Kenny had killed someone before, but why wouldn't she have already shared this information? Because it seems like something that a college kid wouldn't be able to keep to themselves, especially when she wasn't really friends with Kenny or anything. She was in on the prank. I know she did feel bad about it, but she was still very good friends with these people. And this is three years later. So there's been a lot of time that she's been able to tell them, hey, this guy's actually a murderer, maybe you should actually be concerned about this. So that didn't really feel very legitimate. 
Once Doc started looking under the bench across from him, I knew that the killer was going to end up being under the bench that he was sitting on. And the fact that he doesn't think about that, typical for a film like this. I mean, this was the time period, you know, especially in the 80s, where people would just yell at the screen if they saw a film in the theater like this and just be like, don't do that, don't open that, don't go there. Because they literally just did the dumbest things to move the story forward. Obviously, you see that in play at play in here, so you can't really fault the movie because that was, I mean, that's what was going on with film at this time, so it's just par for the course. But when you watch that now, you're just like, of course. And the conductor makes the mistake of assuming the killer would be a male when he lets, when he makes the assumption that the magician, actually a lot of people make the assumption that it's the magician who's doing the killing, which I guess is linked back to when they said we didn't, I think Doc said that they did not hire a magician. So that puts the suspicion on the actual magician himself, David Copperfield's character, and obviously does not even look at his assistant, who ends up being Kenny, obviously, because it's a female, or they believe it's female. So, you know, and that actually speaks to another thing, which is some people could argue that this is kind of a portrayal of someone who's transsexual in a negative manner. I don't know that it was necessarily driven home as being transsexual, more as just being in that costume in order to get on the train in order to fool people and make the murders. Because I don't think there's anything, I may have missed it and you can let me know in the comments, I don't think there was anything in there about Kenny actually being transsexual, although there is a bit of an undertone of them talking about his mental health and then the fact that he does end up showing up in woman in women's clothing would make people make some sort of negative connection. So for that reason, it is problematic now in nowadays society. It was not then. And this is one of those things I always say that when you watch a film like this, you need to remember societally what was going on at the time. Doesn't mean it was right, but it means that it wasn't a conscious thing then. So you need to understand that that's what it was. And for that reason, things like this, I think, are fine to be around because it's a reminder of how far we've come over the decades. Now, if a film like this was made now, I would say, yeah, that's problematic. Because look at society now. You can't do that now. Like, don't do that now. That's the right thing. Do not do a, a film like that now. Solid jump scare when the killer's arm pops out in front of Alana in the hallway after she had stabbed him in one of the little train car areas. Um, it was effective. I, I was legitimately surprised with that. I didn't see it coming, and it worked really well. How the arm just kind of like shoots out in front of the camera, right in front of her face. I liked it. I liked the way they framed it. Very good. The extended scene of Alana fighting and running from the killer is actually pretty solid. It really does ratchet up the tension, the danger. You're really feeling that kind of fear that she's feeling. The movie is relatively slow and meandering up until that point, but I do think that it has a good finish. And that's one of the strongest things about this, so yeah. The killer at the window while Alana is resting, you know, outside the window kind of looking in, it was kind of funny. I found it really laughable. The way, like, he showed up at the window and moved around, it looked just hokey and weird to me. I don't know if anyone else felt that way. But, um, yeah, it just made me kind of laugh, and it kind of took me out of the moment a little bit because it didn't look good. It didn't look menacing, which is it, I know it was supposed to at that point. The final scene between Kenny and Alana is effective, and I like the satisfying thud when Kenny hits the snow after the conductor whacks him with a shovel and out of the side of the train. That was very satisfying because it's this kind of exclamation point on the death of the villain. And I love those types of things. Like that satisfying thud is you see the body just smack down on the ground. It's a good way to end it. It really is. And and like I said, it's a good ending to the film. Even though it's a kind of me bit of a meandering mess mo moving to that point. I like all the long shots from the ends of the train cameras. Uh, they always make them look good. In general, they actually did a really outstanding job shooting in close quarters. You need to consider that they were inside of train cars filming. Though There's not a lot of room to kind of like have the characters moving around, to set up the shots properly, to move the cameras around when they're actually moving. So I think they really did a good job with the technical aspect of that. 
So I, I bet that's not something people really think about that much, but I want to make sure I brought that up because I think it's important. They throw out a few red herrings, like the girl who gets snippy with Mitchie, who says, watch your toes, because it seems as kind of like she's got a thing against her. When Mo tells Doc that he's going to get him, that's another moment that they kind of like linger on a little long to kind of tell you, mm, maybe there's something going on here. And then when Doc says that they didn't hire a magician, and that's obviously in the end what ends up throwing the suspicion on the magician, even though that's kind of on the right path because of the assistant kenny you can tell pretty early that kenny is the killer and i'll tell you why they show the eyes they make a mistake of close up showing the eyes in the mask in the first one the groucho marks one so i was looking at the eyes and i'm like those eyes look exactly like kenny's eyes because they did a close-up kind of freeze frame on kenny's face in the prank scene in the very beginning so it wasn't that long ago. If they had spaced it out more, I may not have picked up on that. But I feel like I'm probably not the only one who ends up picking up on that. I'm sure a lot of people do for that reason. Like, you've seen his face pretty recently, and then you see those eyes. It, it just connects. It connects. So the whole time I knew it was going to end up being Kenny. Um, but towards the end, I didn't realize that Kenny was the assistant. Because I wasn't really focusing on the assistant that much. Because I was watching the magic, even though I complained about there being too many magic tricks. But yeah, that's what it is. So out of five stars with half stars in play, this isn't great, but it's still kind of fun. I'm going to give it two and a half stars. I was between two and two and a half because obviously it's not that great. I, I can't even put it on the so bad it's good scale because I don't really think it's in that category. I feel like it kind of straddles the line between a so bad it's good and just a straight up legitimate film. So I'm going to give it a two and a half star rating. Uh, would love to hear what other people have to say about it. Give me your thoughts in the comments. Do you love this film? Do you hate this film? Are you in the middle, kind of like me? Uh, but let's talk about it. Uh, also, do me a quick favor. If you have not subscribed yet, please, please hit that subscribe button. That is the way to keep me doing these videos. I, it keeps me motivated. It legitimately does. Every time I see a new person subscribing, it really kind of gets me excited. And I'm like, there's another person who's actually consuming what I'm putting out, and they're appreciating it, which obviously makes me want to do more and keep providing it to you guys. Also, you're just kind of joining this nerdy horror community that I'm trying to build because I started this channel just to talk to people about horror, legitimately. Because where I live, I can't really do that. I can't get nerdy about horror like this. And I will bet you the majority of the people that I know who are even into horror, who, I, who live around me, don't even know what Terror Train is. Just saying. But anyway, thanks everyone for checking this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.